Well, welcome back. We're in day 13 of Advent. And now we're in chapter 9. It's titled, In the Witch's House. You can see pictures that we have here. Remember that she was part giant, so she's so big and so tall. Kind of scary, isn't she? Well, let's hear what she has to say. So, just remember that you're always safe, and this is just a story, okay? So, In the Witch's House. And now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund. He'd eaten his share of the dinner, but he hadn't really enjoyed it because he was thinking all the time about Turkish delight. And there's nothing that spoils the taste of good, ordinary food half so much as the memory of bad magic food. And he had heard the conversation, hadn't enjoyed it much either, because he kept on thinking that the others were taking no notice of him and trying to give him the cold shoulder. They weren't. But he imagined it. And then he had listened until Mr. Beaver told him about Aslan, and until he had heard the whole arrangement for meeting Aslan at the stone table. It was then that he began very quietly to edge himself under the curtain which hung over the door, for the mention of Aslan gave him a mysterious and horrible feeling, just as it gave the others a mysterious and lovely feeling. Just as Mr. Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle, and just before Mr. Beaver had begun telling them that the white witch wasn't really human at all, but half a djinn and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside in the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. You mustn't think that even now Edmund was quite so bad that he actually wanted his brothers and his brother and sisters to be turned into stone. He did want Turkish delight, and to be a prince, and later a king, and to pay Peter out for calling him a beast. As for what the witch would do with the others, he didn't want her to be particularly nice to them, certainly not to put them on the same level as himself. But he managed to believe, or pretend he believed, that she wouldn't do anything very bad to them. Because, he said to himself, all these people who say nasty things about her are her enemies, and probably half of it isn't true. She was jolly nice to me, anyway, much nicer than they are. I expect she is the rightful queen, really. Anyway, she'll be better than that awful Aslan. At least that was the excuse he made in his own mind for what he was doing. It wasn't a very good excuse, however, for deep down inside him, he really knew that the white witch was bad and cruel. The first thing he realized when he got outside and found the snow falling all around him was that he had left his coat behind in the beaver's house. And, of course, there was no chance of going back to get it now. The next thing he realized was that the daylight was almost gone, for it had been nearly three o'clock when they sat down to dinner and the winter days were short. He hadn't reckoned on this, but he had to make the best of it. So he turned up his collar and shuffled across the top of the dam, Luckily, it wasn't so slippery since the snow had fallen to the far side of the river. It was pretty bad when he reached the far side. It was growing darker every minute. And what with that and the snowflakes swirling all round him, he could hardly see three feet ahead. And then, and then, too, there was no road. He kept slipping into deep drifts of snow and skidding on frozen puddles, tripping over fallen tree trunks and sliding down steep banks and barking his shins against rocks till he was wet and cold and bruised all over. The silence and the loneliness were dreadful. In fact, I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, Well, when I'm king of Narnia, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads. And of course, that set him off to thinking about being a king and all the other things he would do, and this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have, and how many cars, and all about his private cinema, and where the principal railways would run, and what laws he would make against beavers and dams, and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place, when the weather changed. First the snow stopped, then a wind sprang up and it became freezing cold. Finally the clouds rolled away and the moon came out. It was a full moon. And shining on all that snow, it made everything almost as bright as day, only the shadows were rather confusing. 
he would never have found his way if the moon hadn't come out by the time he got to the other river. You remember he had seen, when they first arrived at the Beavers, a smaller river flowing into the great one lower down. He now reached this and turned to follow it up. But the little valley down which it came was much steeper and rockier than the one he had just left, and much overgrown with bushes, so that he could not have managed it at all in the dark. Even as it was, he got wet through, for he had to stoop under branches, and great loads of snow came sliding off onto his back. And every time this happened, he thought more and more how he hated Peter, just as if this all had been Peter's fault. But at last he came to a part where it was more level and the valley opened out. And there, on the other side of the river, quite close to him, in the middle of a plain, little plain between two hills, he saw what must be the white witch's house. And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunces caps or sorcerer's caps. And they shone in the moonlight, and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. Edmund began to be afraid of the house. But it was too late to think of turning back now. He crossed the river on the ice and walked up to the house. There was nothing stirring, not the slightest sound anywhere. Even his own feet made no noise on the deep, newly fallen snow. He walked on and on, past corner after corner of the house, past turret after turret, to find the door. He had to go right round to the far side before he found it. It was a huge arch, but the great iron gates stood wide open. Edmund crept up to the arch and looked inside into the courtyard, and there he saw a sight that nearly made his heart stop beating. Just inside the gate, with the moonlight shining on it, stood an enormous lion, crouched as if it was ready to spring. And Edmund stood in the shadow of the arch, afraid to go on and afraid to go back, with his knees knocking together. He stood there so long that his, cheat, his teeth would have been chattering with cold, even if they had not been chattering with fear. How long this really lasted, I don't know, but it seemed to Edmund to last for hours. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all. But supposing it turns its head, thought Edmund. In fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. Aha, thought Edmund, when it springs at the dwarf, then will be my chance to escape. But still the lion never moved, nor did the dwarf. And now at last Edmund remembered what the others had said about the white witch turning people into stone. Perhaps this was only a stone lion, and as soon as he had thought of that, he noticed that the lion's back and the top of its head were covered with snow. Of course it must be only a statue. No living animal would have let itself get covered with snow. Then very slowly, and with his heart beating as if it would burst, Edmund ventured to go up to the lion. Even now he hardly dared to touch it, but at last he put out his hand very quickly and did. It was cold stone. He had been frightened of a mere statue. We'll stop there tonight. and We'll see what happens next as Edmund goes into the White Witch's castle. Hope you have a good night. And God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.